People have always kept a close eye on the time. First, we look to the heavenly bodies, and now we look at digital displays. While our methods of timekeeping have gotten more sophisticated, the question remains, what exactly is time? Hi, I'm Rich Burnett for Wondrium, and in this episode of Perspectives, four experts share how our concept of time has changed since Newton, and how looking into our past can help define the nature of our universe. We start now at the beginning of all time with the Big Bang. The Big Bang itself describes that first initial instant, the moment when the universe first burst into being from an infinitely dense and hot primordial point known as the singularity. At the instant of the universe's birth, this point began to expand, ballooning from impossibly infinitely small into the beginnings of what we now know as the entire universe. If you think this is sounding a bit like science fiction or even poetry, that's understandable. The laws of physics themselves make it very hard for us to study that initial beginning point of the universe. However, even in the tiniest fractions of a second after the Big Bang, physics does allow us to begin describing our new and evolving universe. What happened in the moments after the Big Bang to get us to where we are today? How did the universe get so big? Where did the first atoms come from? The first stars? The first galaxies? When we talk about the beginning of the universe, we're trying to understand these earliest moments and how they affect what we observe today. So what does all of this have to do with how the universe ends? Where we think the universe came from and how it got to what we see today matters a great deal when we try to project forward to where it's going. Those initial moments that drove the formation and expansion of the universe will continue to influence the evolution of the universe and its ultimate end. Will it keep expanding forever? If it does, will that expansion eventually rip the universe apart or cause it to slowly drift apart, fading and cooling into oblivion? Or will this expansion slow down, stop, and maybe even reverse? Will the universe eventually careen back inward in a reversal of the Big Bang, ending in a big crunch and a new singularity? These are exciting and compelling questions, but they're also incredibly hard to answer. Fortunately, astronomers today have the tools we need to develop and test theories that reach as far back as the beginning of time and as far forward as the end of everything. With cutting edge telescopes, astronomers can measure how the universe is moving and expanding today, measuring how quickly galaxies are moving away from us, calculating the Hubble constant, and testing whether those data are consistent with the universe that's getting ready to crunch back together or tear itself apart. This might seem strange because it isn't obvious that looking at the universe today would tell us much about its earliest beginnings, but this is where the speed of light is on our side. Observing very distant galaxies is like looking back in time. Since light emitted millions or billions of years ago is just now arriving at Earth. Studying those galaxies' properties and how they move helps us to fit the pieces of the universe that we study into a puzzle that changes with time. And studying those changes tells us how the universe has evolved. We can also use that same principle, the speed of light and observations that act like time machines, to peer as far across the universe and as far back in time as we possibly can, detecting light from some of the earliest moments of the universe. The cosmic microwave background is the faint radio wavelength glow of light emitted in the earliest epochs of the universe. And the properties of that background act as fingerprints of things that happened even earlier in the universe's beginnings. By combining these observations and everything we know about the laws of physics, we can begin to answer questions that may have once seemed impossible to address. For Newton, time is absolute. God wears the divine Rolex, and all of reality is divided up into absolute time slices. 
That is, three-dimensional spaces arranged in an absolute order. Think of a film. Not the movie you watch, but the film itself on the reel that would go through the projector. It was a long strip comprised of individual frames. Each frame is the entirety of space, and the order of the frames is the entirety of time for the movie. Film space is absolute because for each thing we can say exactly how far something is over and up from the bottom left-hand corner of the frame in which it appears. And time is absolute because we can say exactly how many frames into the movie it is. Space and time are both absolute and independent. Einstein knew this concept of space was wrong. His hero, H. A. Lawrence, had described the way lengths contract for moving observers. But no one understood why this happened. Indeed, pretty much everyone, including Lawrence himself, thought it was a quirk of math. It didn't really happen. But Einstein took the math seriously. The transformation equation said it did, so that's what the physics tells us about the world. But why? He took a long walk in the mountains with a friend, thinking about this question. He took the train back home to Bern. Glancing over his shoulder at the clock on the train station as he walked away from it, it hit him. The clock does not show what time it is. The clock shows what time it was. To read the clock, light bounces off the clock and travels to your eye. But he was walking away from the clock. The light would not only have to reach him, it would have to catch up with him to do it. If an observer moves away from the clock, the light would arrive slightly later. The faster he went, the more it would have to do to catch up to him. So, the faster he walked away from the clock, the slower the clock would appear to move. Remember that Einstein at this point was under the spell of Ernst Mach's positivism. What is real is what's observable, what we measure. Time is what the clock tells us it is. So, if the clock is moving slower for moving observers, then time itself slows when observers move. What Lawrence had done for length also needed to be done for duration. This was the key to the special theory of relativity. This effect is called time dilation. Time passes at different rates for different observers moving at different speeds. It was most colorfully illustrated by Einstein's friend, the French physicist Paul Langevin with his famous twins paradox. Suppose we have two twins who are both 20 years old. One stays on Earth while the other becomes an astronaut. The astronaut travels very fast for the duration of the mission, returning to Earth 20 Earth years later. The twin who was left on Earth will be 20 years older, that is, 40 years old. The twin stepping out of the rocket will only be 37 years old. The astronaut twin doesn't just look younger, but using a clock and a calendar would have only experienced 17 years in the same time the earthbound twin experienced 20. The passing of time is a relative measure. Einstein understood this, but he did not, however, fully understand the philosophically radical nature of the insight. After he published it, the paper was read by a mathematician turned physicist named Hermann Minkowski, who did understand exactly how radical it was. Minkowski recast the theory and delivered a famous talk on it called Space and Time in 1909, where he explains to Einstein and the world the true conceptual meaning of Einstein's theory, which is that no longer can space and time be thought of as independent elements as Newton conceived. Rather, they had to be thought of as united into a single four-dimensional space-time. Minkowski had been one of Einstein's teachers and was a better mathematician than Einstein. What he realized was that Einstein had unified space and time into what we now call space-time. Essentially, space and time are now known to be the same thing. Further, what he realized was that Einstein's transformation equations were just rotations in space-time. But what it means to do a rotation in space-time is tough to get your head around. So let's use a familiar analogy of a two-dimensional vector from introductory algebra. Start out drawing an x and y axis and a vector of some fixed length. Now let's spin that vector however we want. It can point along the x-axis with nothing along the y-axis, or it could go the other way, pointing along the y-axis and not the x. 
or it could point somewhere between the two, pointing a little bit in the x direction and a little bit in the y direction. No matter what direction the vector points, the length is always the same. So that's one conclusion. The length of the vector doesn't care about x and y individually. And equivalently, you could keep the vector stationary and rotate the axes. The projections of the vector on the x and y axes change, even though the vector doesn't. That is at the core of Minkowski's insight. In relativity, the mathematics are pretty similar. Now, instead of x and y being the horizontal and vertical axes, just imagine that the horizontal axis is space and the vertical axis is time. So let's think about a person who is stationary in space. They only experience translations through time and none through space. So their space-time vector is pointing upwards along the time axis. On the other hand, we saw that a person moving faster and faster compared to you experienced times that were shorter and shorter. And when you get to the speed of light, the time experienced by that person eventually goes to zero. So at the speed of light, there is only moving through space and no movement through time. That means that the space-time vector becomes horizontal. The only changes to experience are in space, while there's no changes in time. And, of course, if a person is moving at a velocity through space less than the speed of light, they're experiencing both changes in space and time. The important point is that a person's space-time vector, that is, the combined experience of both space and time, is unchanged. One person might experience more space and less time, while another might experience more time and less space. But the combination, the length of the space-time vector, is something everyone agrees on. And this has absolutely huge consequences. It means that a person's velocity through space-time is constant, and further, their speed is the speed of light. A stationary person is moving through time at the speed of light, while a person moving 100% through space and not at all through time is moving at the speed of light through space. And that is a deep and fundamental and completely satisfying answer for the question of why can't you go faster than the speed of light. It's because that everything is always going at that one single speed. And it also shows in the most intimate of ways how space and time are one and the same, and how you experience the two is just a matter of perspective. But moving backward through time is another thing altogether. And it's with backward time travel that serious logical problems start to appear. The most famous illustration of these kinds of problems is known as the grandfather paradox. Let me describe it to you. Imagine that I follow a closed time-like curve to a point in the past. At this point, I encounter and then kill my own grandfather while he's still a child. As a consequence of these actions, my grandfather never grows up. He never meets my grandmother, and he never has any children or grandchildren. This means I'm never born, and therefore I never exist, and that means I never travel backwards through time to kill my grandfather. So since he was never killed, my grandfather survives to meet my grandmother, and they do have children and grandchildren together. So once again, I do exist. And then, of course, I do travel through time to kill my grandfather, and you can see the problem. Backwards time travel makes it impossible for there to be a self-consistent timeline. The grandfather paradox has been a staple of science fiction since the 1930s. But in addition to producing some very entertaining storytelling, it also serves to illustrate the logical hazards that can come with unrestricted time travel. Any system in which it's possible to change the past suffers from these kinds of problems. And that means that any system containing closed time-like curves seems, to seems sure to lead to paradoxical nonsense. You should also keep in mind that this conclusion doesn't only apply to people or other living things that might travel through time. An electron, for example, might travel through a closed time-like curve only to prevent it from ever coming into existence. On fairly general grounds, the existence of closed time-like curves seems to break the very logical self-consistency of the universe. When Gödel pointed out that closed time-like curves could exist even in a hypothetical universe, this gave us a deep and good reason to worry about the self-consistency of general relativity itself. Even though we don't actually live in a universe like the one described by Gödel's solution, it's not clear that our universe is entirely safe from the kinds of logical inconsistencies that could be associated with the existence of closed time-like curves. Some of these potential problems regarding time were explored further in later years, and especially in the 1960s, 
when interest in general relativity was growing among scientists. For example, solutions to the field equations were found during this period of time that describe not only stationary black holes, but also black holes that are rotating or spinning. To the surprise of many, these solutions appear to show that the space and time immediately surrounding a rotating black hole can also contain closed time-like curves. Like in Gödel's universe, the existence of rotating black holes seems, at least at first glance, to be logically problematic for general relativity and for time itself. Over the past several decades, a number of other solutions containing closed time-like curves have been found. Among the most famous are those that feature what are known as wormholes. A wormhole is something like a portal, a portal that connects two points in space to each other. By traveling through a wormhole, one could, in principle, travel directly from one place to another. It might not seem obvious, but it turns out that in order for something like a wormhole to be able to instantly transport something across space, it must also be able to function as a time machine. In fact, anything that is capable of moving from one place to another at a speed faster than the speed of light must also allow one to travel backward in time. So the existence of wormholes or of anything else that enables one to travel faster than light also implies the existence of closed time-like curves. In recent decades, different physicists have expressed a wide range of views about the issues involved with closed time-like curves and time travel. Some work has been done during this time which seems to show that some of the logical paradoxes associated with time travel can be avoided or circumvented. And other work has shown that some of the most problematic kinds of closed time-like curves seem unlikely to really exist. Hey, thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about the topics in this episode, the full list of series that these clips came from is in the description below. You can watch them all on Wondrium. And don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel for new episodes of Perspectives, and you can watch previous ones here.